As we begin our time in the Word of God, let's come to Him in a word of prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessing and joy it is to come to the study of your Word, and in particular, too, the blessing that comes as we study Bible prophecy. And we pray, Lord, as we come to your Word, that you would once again open our eyes to hear and our hearts to receive what it is that you want to teach us from your Word, that through it we may be blessed and also bring glory and honour to your name. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, what we're doing is coming now to the next in our series, uh, where we're actually going to be considering Daniel chapter 9. So if you remember last week, we looked at uh, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream in in chapter 2, combined with the dream that Daniel received in chapter 7, so the beasts and the statues. But this week, we're looking at the 70 weeks of Daniel, or Daniel's 70 weeks, as it's called, It's a little bit misleading in that what we're looking at is 70 weeks of Israel's future. And that's really what this passage is all about. But the thing is, when we come to this, it is also pivotal. This particular passage is pivotal to an understanding of Bible prophecy. As such, it is also one that is hotly debated because many times people come at this with their preconceived ideas and their presuppositions and their biases, wanting Daniel to speak to their particular model or their particular approach. And we read it in a certain way. But what I hope that we do today is look at this from the perspective of what it means for Israel's future. And of course, there's ramification then for where the church fits in on all of that. But the fundamental question is, what is to be the future of Israel? not only from the time of Daniel, but even today and into the future. And it's something that we will continue to look at even into next week in another passage of Scripture. But this morning we'll be looking at Daniel chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, would you open them with me please to Daniel 9? And we'll be reading from verses 16 through to 27. Daniel 9 verse 16. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts... Let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all those who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon the sanctuary which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill and for my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place." Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in trouble time. And after the sixty-two weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary sanctuary 
Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. This is God's word. So when we look at this particular passage, we we are coming off the back end of a prayer that we see Daniel praying. And as he does so, the angel Gabriel comes to him from the throne room of heaven in swift flight to give him some insight in response to what it is that he's praying for. But for us to understand the context of this, we do need to know a little bit of the backstory behind this. So what is the history? What's going on in particular uh, with regard to the way Daniel prays and this response that we've received? What has actually happened in the land of Israel? So the Israelites are in captivity in Babylon. And we saw that in our previous passages and we learned from a lot of that in Daniel and other places of the scriptures. But what is the reason that they're in captivity? Well, we know that it was their faithlessness, that they had disobeyed God's commands. In fact, actually, if you were to go back and read Leviticus chapter 25, there were actually some laws that were supposed to be observed with regard to the land of Israel. They were allowed to cultivate the land for six years. But in the seventh year, God had told them to let the land rest. You know, whilst as a people, each week they would work for six days, but they were required to rest on the seventh But then when it came to the land, they could work the land for six years, but the land was supposed to rest for the seventh. They weren't supposed to do anything but enjoy the provision that God had made, and he would give it to them in abundance. So it's not like they had to. But of course, as a lot of stubborn people are going to do, they think, well, why let the land be dormant? Why has God made this rule? Why don't we work the land in that year and have extra produce so that we can sell it and make more money? And so they blatantly disregarded the law of God, in spite of the punishment that would come with that. Now, this had actually gone on for 490 years. So for 490 years, every seventh year, they had failed to keep this land rest or this land Sabbath. And they'd worked the land, contrary to what God had said. But also coming with that, that in general terms, also we have in Deuteronomy 28, were also the promises that would come with Israel faithfully obeying the covenant of God, but also the punishment for disobedience. What would come of the nation if they disregarded God's law? And he'd actually said that you do this, you will be punished and I will bring the other nations against you. So what has actually occurred now with uh, Israel being in exile is all as a result of their disobedience to the law. So fast forwarding at least from those laws in those 490 years, God then sent the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah would speak to the people and as we warn, he was warning them in chapter 25 of the things to come. Uh, If you're making notes, obviously take a look at that later, but what he was warning them is that you are about to go into exile for 70 years. One year, for every year that you failed to let the land rest. And in fact, we'll look at that in a moment, but that is actually what God had said would happen if they failed to let the land rest. He would forcibly let the land rest. And so Jeremiah was now raised to give them a warning. But the people didn't hear that. They didn't hear the warning. They didn't turn from it. And so as a result, as we would read, as predicted in that passage in Jeremiah, that God said he would bring the king of Babylon, he would bring Nebuchadnezzar to come and take them captive. And he did so in three waves. Israel, or the southern kingdom there, was taken off into captivity into Babylon. The last of which was in 586 BC. It was when the last of Israel was taken there. What God also did say in verse 12 of that, of Jeremiah 25, was that after the 70 years have elapsed, he would punish Israel. Babylon, but also too that Israel would have a chance of returning to the land. Okay, so then what happened is because Israel failed to hear and they've now gone into captivity, what also occurred is that later Jeremiah wrote chapter 29. Don't turn there necessarily, I'll just read a portion out for you. 
but he wrote this particular letter to those that were in exile. And, uh, and he was telling them, you're in exile, you're going to be in exile for 70 years. Don't listen to the false prophets that are telling you that before long you're going back home to Jerusalem, you need to settle down for the long haul because you're going to be here for 70 years in its entirety. And so he had written this prophecy to the exiles that were in captivity. And this is the scroll from our passage where Daniel, in, 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 in chapter 9, we actually see that he was sitting here in, uh, in, in the first year of Darius, he was reading a passage from the book of Jeremiah, which was relating to their time in captivity. And this is the portion of scroll that Daniel actually ended up reading. That was in Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14, he said, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for, for Babylon, I will visit you, I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you to exile. So this is the portion of the scroll that Daniel is reading. And what we find then in the chapter of Daniel, this has prompted him now to want to pray to God as to this return and get the nation restored back to Jerusalem because he knew that it would be 70 years. So within this particular passage, we learn that from a timeline perspective, Daniel verse 2, it's during that first year of the reign of Darius. And in response to reading this, Daniel then ushers a prayer. Now, we don't have the time this morning to look at this prayer in detail, but it would be interesting and fascinating to study if we were doing this in a series at, in Daniel at some point. But it's an amazing and a rich prayer. But what we need to understand is the context and the purpose and the manner in which Daniel prayed and how that relates to this particular passage. Because what we see is the prayer that Daniel prays, the praise rather, is not in relation to what Jeremiah had said. There was actually no call to repentance. In fact, what Jeremiah said is God is going to bring you back to this land, not through anything Israel would have to do. So why is it then that we see Daniel wanting to come to the Lord, asking for forgiveness for his own sins and for the sins of his people? And rightly so, we all do that. We come to the Lord in prayer for our sins and so on. But Daniel's not only praying for his own, but also the nation. To understand the backstory, we need to know a little bit of this from a passage in Leviticus. So keep your finger in Daniel and turn with me to Leviticus chapter 26, and we'll see some of the purposes and the reasons around this whole Sabbath rest requirement and the response. In Leviticus 26, from verse 33, we read, And I will scatter you among the nations, I will unsheath the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation, and your cities shall be a waste. So this is in response to Israel's failure to keep that land Sabbath or that land rest. He goes on to say, And then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. While you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, the rest that it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. So here, there's the prediction. So for every year that Israel failed to leave the land at rest, they would spend in captivity. And that's the purpose behind the 70 years that God had decreed. Skip down to verse 40, and we see, But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. 
So we see here, as God had said, is Israel recognizing their faithlessness to God. And after their time in exile, if they asked for their sins to be forgiven, the God would remember them and bring them back to the land. And that is the context that has actually influenced Daniel's prayer. He launches into this prayer of confession for his own sins and on behalf of the nation, hoping then that God is going to now act as their 70 years are coming to an end. Listen again to the closing portion of Daniel's prayer as he's making this plea toward God in verses 18 and 19. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Can you hear the passion in, in the prayer? Asking God to act not for anything that they've done, there is no good necessarily of themselves, but he, of themselves, but he wants God to act because of his name. And note the close of that prayer is asking God to act on behalf of his city and his people. And that is the theme that we're actually going to see in the response that the angel Gabriel brings to Daniel. It's focused on events surrounding his people and his city, that is the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And in verse 20, you will have seen here that while he is speaking and praying, the angel Gabriel now appears before him in swift dispatch from the throne room of God. He now stands before him and his response, as we read from the second half of verse 22 onward, he says, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Sit with that for a minute and just think, at the beginning of his prayer, an angel has been dispatched from heaven to answer his prayer. I think we all feel like that sometimes too. You know, we, we pray and you think, oh, if only God would send an angel to me straight away in response to my prayer. Although whilst we obviously don't always have the privilege of an angel being dispatched from heaven, it does remind us too that our prayers are heard at the throne room of God. Every time that you pray, God hears your prayer. And that is great encouragement to know that we are called to pray, but he does hear us. He's not sitting silent. But here now, this angel has come in a swift dispatch and he's now come to Daniel, but for what purpose? As we see here highlighted that he is coming here to give him insight and understanding. Because the thing is, it's, it's not that there's been a problem with Daniel's interpretation of Jeremiah and Leviticus. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a great prayer and something worth studying and learning from. It's just that Daniel's interpretation of that was a bit skew if. His understanding was not full and what God is looking to do is now fill his understanding, give him insight and understanding to know what God's plans are for the nation of Israel and for the holy city of Jerusalem. That's the focus here. In Daniel's mind, he's thinking that the time of the Gentiles that Jesus would later refer to as Gentiles having control of the city of Jerusalem, that is something that has never occurred yet and is likely to be in the future if we believe the scriptures. But Daniel's thinking maybe that time of Gentile dominance comes to an end, that we will be able to go back to Jerusalem to restore the temple and get back to the way things were, that they would be fully restored. And perhaps he was even thinking too that that would even usher in the Messiah that would come as was promised in the scriptures. But we see here that Daniel has come to give him insight. And this is the insight and understanding he's been told here in verse 24. 70 weeks a decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. And so we're looking at here at not 70 years as what Daniel's assuming, 
that they're going to be in captivity for 70 years, but the correction here is 70 weeks are decreed. Now, we think of the word weeks. The Hebrew word here is Shabbat, which essentially means seven. What Angel Gabriel is saying is that 70 sevens are decreed for your people. 70 sevens being 490 if you do the maths, but what is this number? What are these 70 sevens a picture of? You know, for us as a, as a people, we tend to think in tens and decades, whereas for the Jews and Israel, they would often think in sevens, being a perfect and a complete number for them. But we need to be careful at this point if we start to look at these numbers and read our own interpretation into it. Because we could suddenly then say, is this a literal 77s or 490, or is it something symbolic? Now, at this point, a lot of people, that they like to treat this passage as symbolic, and the reason they'll do that is they're remembering even the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, when he was asked, how many times should I forgive somebody? Should it be up to seven times? And Jesus says, not seven times, but 77, or depending on your translation, 70 times seven, indicating unlimited forgiveness. But in that context, Jesus was speaking about forgiveness and gives an illustration of the abundance of the heart that we should be willing to forgive somebody that's trespassed or erred against us. But in this particular passage, there is nothing in here that allows us to link the two and to assume that because Jesus used it in the future, that suddenly these 77s are now a symbolic number. And we need to keep that in the back of our mind. Remember the golden rule of Bible interpretation, you know, being the context is if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense or it may lead to nonsense. So we need to read the words at face value is what is the word of God saying in this context and how do we look at it that? And if it doesn't make sense, then what else does the Bible have to say about that? But what we need to think too with regard to this is that, so Daniel He's treating Jeremiah as a prophet. He treats Jeremiah's words as a literal 70 years. And we need to then assume at this particular point before we do any other maths or any other leap in logic, we need to assume that also the response given to Daniel must also be a literal thing. That his misinterpretation is not that suddenly he's thinking only in 70 years and suddenly it's a great expanse of time, but we need to think as if he's talking 70 times 7, what is that? And how is that played out? Like the, the exactness that we had even with the Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, there were literal interpretations of those that we saw play out through history. Do we see the same thing happening here with regard to this particular response? Also, it also helps to know too, just to put our minds in their context, is that the Jewish calendar is also not like ours. We think in 365 day years with a leap year every four years, but for the Jewish calendar, it was based on the lunar calendar. They had 30 days in a month or 360 days in a year. And what that means is that we need to look at this in the context of how many days in a year and how that plays out. Not that we want to get into overly complicated mathematics here and so on, but it just helps to know some of these things because we will see those appear in the text. We don't need to get out the calculator and do anything strange. But also, if you remember last week, there was a time where uh, one of the beasts would pursue and conquer the Jews for time, times and half a time, which we saw as three and a half years. In the Jewish calendar, that comes down to 1,260 days which is key because we will see those words appear at the end of Daniel, time, times and half a time, but in Revelation we see 1,260 days. And that's why when we look at Daniel and we look at Revelation, the Bible's explaining itself. And this particular translation, when we see this uh, 77s and it plays out, the, the numbers mean something. And so when we also look at Revelation and, and the three and a half years and seven years and, and 1,260 days, etc., they actually have more literal timelines in mind that certain events are going to occur with precise accuracy. And that's what we need to keep in mind when we look at this. So the correction in Daniel's understanding was not that it's 70 years, but it's 77s or 490 of something. What is that? 
And the focus being too, in response to the prayer, it's based on your holy city and your people. We need to remember this has got nothing to do with the church or any other people group. This is related to Israel. What is God's plan for the nation of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem? Let's then look at the purpose behind that. What is the sevenfold purpose that we see in the text? Now, reading this in our Bibles, we will see six things, but just I've listed this as a sevenfold purpose because in the Hebrew, there's a dividing word called ve, like the word and. And between these, if we read it in the natural from the Hebrew to the English, we would see uh, there is a sevenfold purpose. And the purpose of these 77s is to finish the transgression and to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity and to bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint a most holy place. Nothing magical about the number seven here. It's just that we see a sevenfold purpose. So let's just think about each of those for a moment. Why is it that this 77-fold purpose is coming? We see here the first being transgression, to bring an end or to finish transgression. And we know even from the context, this is because of Israel's rebellion. If they had failed to keep God's law, and they did so on, on an ongoing basis throughout their own history. But then when we get to the time of Christ too, we see that they even rejected the Messiah that God had promised. And this is something that even still Israel today, in the hardness of their own heart, transgression is still occurring. So whilst there's partial fulfillment of an end of transgression that we see through the cross of Christ, he made an atonement for sin, which we'll get to in just a moment, but there is also still uh, ongoing transgression. It hasn't been completed yet. Secondly, we see an end to sin. It's partial. Christ paid the penalty on the cross, but we haven't seen sin end we still see sin in the world. It's uh, it, that there is a promise that the nation of Israel, through the new covenant, eventually that they would sin no more. We haven't seen that yet. Thirdly, is the atonement, uh, the atoning for iniquity. And we see that partially fulfilled through the cross of Christ. But again, uh, we're seeing Israel continuing to fail to keep all of those Old Testament commandments. There would, by implication, there be a future fulfillment of that. So you could make an argue on these first three that there could maybe be a partial or a full fulfillment depending on your particular background or or how you're coming at this. But note the remaining four on the list that there is actually very much a future fulfillment. We see uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness that Israel have been brought back into their land. We see that happening now on an ongoing basis but their full redemption has not yet been realised. And that was the picture we saw through the dreams we looked at last week, is that Christ would come, the stone would be set up, and those kingdoms, etc., would be going away forever. That hasn't happened yet. Next is to seal up vision and to seal up prophecy. Now, we're not going to get into a debate on whether the gifts continue today and we still see prophecy and visions being given, etc. Again, this is not to do with the church, it's to do with Israel. Tied in with the covenant promises is that one day God would put a new heart in his people and no longer would people need prophets. They wouldn't need visions and dreams, but God is the one that would instruct them personally. Again, that hasn't happened yet. And lastly was to anoint a most holy place. There was an anointing of a particular temple and we still haven't seen that happen because there is talk through here and through the scriptures and Jesus' own words of a future desecration of a temple and some desolations would be decreed, but then there would be restoration at the end when a most holy place would be anointed. And that's the thing is when we see this from these 77s, when these have elapsed or reached their fulfillment, we will see all seven of those things having been fully fulfilled. And it's at that time is when the Messiah would come up and set up the Messianic kingdom, which was also promised in the Old Testament. And so here is what we then see in verses 25 to 27, and then we'll break it down at a high level. We won't go into infinite detail today, but 25 to 7. So with all these things, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks.' 
Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So the language that we're reading throughout here seems to be a timeline, a sequential order, very literal in that a certain number of things are happening at certain periods of time. And what we look at it in terms of the context is the most natural reading this of these, not 70 years, but 70 times seven years, we're looking at a 490 year timeline. What is that timeline? Where does it begin? Where does it end? And what events do we see that marry up with that? Already we've seen in Daniel a massive uh, accuracy in terms of the success rate for the past uh, visions and dreams to have come fulfilled. How has this one played out? Now, if we had time, we could go into all the background and the archaeological evidence and all the things that have occurred, but without blowing your head with all these numbers, let me just throw a couple of things out to you so we know at least what we can look for to know, when did the clock start on any of this? And where a lot of people have analysed the text, the first decree that we see in the Scriptures is in the book of Ezra. In fact, we see three decrees. In, in Ezra, in, at the start of it, we see in the first year of Cyrus, and that was in 536 BC, a decree went forth to rebuild the temple. And that here we then see is, however, the first marker here is the declaration to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, the decree was for the temple, but this is for Jerusalem, so it's not exactly the best match. What, by the way, as a side thought, what I find interesting too is that the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before the event, names Cyrus by name, that he would actually decree this, which I find fascinating that the scriptures would even name an individual to that point as well. But that's perhaps not the best marker. The next was in the second year of Darius, as we also read later in Ezra, in 520 BC, he reaffirmed that same decree. So it doesn't seem like we're there yet. In the seventh year of Artaxerxes in 457 BC, there was a decree for Ezra to go teach the law and to form a government. That doesn't match either. The closest match we then have is with the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, in verses 1 to 8, we see a decree in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the decree to finish building the city. It's the first degree, a decree that we see to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and that was in 444 BC. Now, a bunch of clever people have done a lot of analysis on that, and there's uh, some scope to agree and disagree on the different numbers, and we're not going to go through all of those and the pros and cons of each, but what I find fascinating is perhaps one of the most respected and, uh, and held-to views. Look at the, uh, plotting this out. From 444 BC, when you consider in light of the Jewish calendar and this particular decree, after seven weeks we would see that the temple, uh, sorry, the city walls would be constructed and then there was a period of 62 weeks looking at their history where everything would be built with squares and a moat and so on as we see in the text. But then there's the other marker, at the end of 69 weeks what we're looking for is an anointed one being cut off. The word anointed in the Hebrew is Mashiach, which is where we get the word Messiah. The Messiah would be cut off. So you would think that this is now placing us in the time of Jesus, the Messiah. And if you're thinking that, you're correct. Because those that have mapped it out have actually looked at the date the decree would have happened in history and played all the days out. They can pinpoint in one particular calculation that the end of those 69 weeks was the precise time that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And within days, he was crucified. Which strikes me as fascinating because if you think of Israel at the time, if they knew and studied and held to their scriptures and they saw these things happening, there will have been some people looking at this, but the other leaders weren't even looking at a Messiah that would appear on the scene after 
483 years after these 69 weeks have elapsed, where an anointed one would be cut off. There's talk of a Messiah, but they weren't looking for him. But what's interesting is that Zechariah, in Zechariah 9 verse 9, speaks of Jesus, the Messiah would come, that he would ride into Jerusalem on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. And it lines up precisely with what the scriptures had taught here. So already we're seeing some markers here, but just before we flick to the next slide here, just notice some of the other details in the timeline, that once the anointed one is cut off, then the city and the temple would be destroyed, that war would be declared, there'd be you know, wars until the end, that there would be a covenant now for one more week, and in the midst of that covenant, some sacrifices would end until the point that the desecrator, one that would desecrate the temple, would come to an end. But what's fascinating though is after these 69 weeks, what we've seen is a timeline that marries up precisely with the decree to rebuild the city and also with Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. So we need to be careful, and this is where a lot of ink has been spent writing and debating over these particular views. But we then have to look at the forward events after we see Christ having been sacrificed. What next? Do we read the desecrations and the other things to come as being what happened in AD 70 or something else? Because looking at the text, we see in, in verse 25, uh, we've got the, 60, the seven and the 62 weeks, the city is built. In 26, we see that the anointed one being cut off and having nothing, but then the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood. This was talking of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which was a period of time after Christ had, had died on the cross and, and risen again to heaven. But the people of the prince to come, and this is what people have debated. Who's the prince and who are the people? Now, of course, we can't answer all of that today and more will come to light as we progress through the series further. But uh, uh, what most people will see is that the prince to come is really what is known as the Antichrist, the one that would one day set himself up in the place of God, desecrate the temple and so on. But it's the people of the prince to come, the empire that is there. And this is part of that statue that we saw with the legs of iron and the feet, the Roman statue, but something to occur at the end of that people group that these people would destroy the city and its sanctuary. And that's really the Roman Empire we see having destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. But then it says, whilst the city is destroyed, to the end there shall be war. And this is where now we're seeing this big question of wars and rumours of wars and things playing out. There is no uh, point here of discussing really the church age. We're not seeing the church age here in the text. Uh, none of the Old Testament prophets could even foresee a church age or the timeline where we fit? Where do we sit in the grand scheme of things? And really that is the big hotly debated question. What's happening in this gap in between? And in fact, in the Old Testament scriptures, the concept of a gap in time is not foreign to us. When we look at Isaiah 9 verse 6, when to, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, there is a gap between the son being given the birth of Christ, but then also the government being on his shoulders is the last part of the verse, which we haven't seen happen yet. It's not that Christ is reigning in any official government capacity. There is a future fulfillment of that. How do we know? Even from Jesus' own words, when he read from the scroll back in Nazareth, when he st was starting his ministry in Isaiah 61, if you remember he, he was reading from the scroll, but in, the, in Isaiah passage, what we note is that he stopped before the words and to preach the day of vengeance of our God. Because Christ was saying his first coming was here, but then there's a gap, and the last statement was the day of vengeance of our God. But for the context that we're looking at here today is that interesting passage in Zechariah chapter 9, where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey or on, on, the, on the colt. And we see here, there's a gap between uh, verses 9 and 10. That it speaks in his first coming of him having righteousness, salvation, coming humble, mounted on a donkey. But then there's this gap in between it because we see 
in verse 10 that he speaks peace to the nations and will rule from sea to sea. We don't actually see Christ actually physically ruling and reigning from sea to sea or speaking peace to the nations. The nations haven't seen peace. Whilst it is inherent in the gospel, when we share the gospel, it is a gospel of peace, we still haven't seen Christ yet ruling from sea to sea. And that's what the Scriptures in their entirety speak of a future time where Christ will physically rule and reign, but we're not there yet. And so we've got a gap in between. And that is something that we'll need to look at for next week. As to what does it look like? What is this church age? And what's the relationship of the church and Israel? How the two go hand in hand. But we've seen 69 weeks, we see that there's a potential gap in between, which leaves us this big question around the remaining week. And there are many thoughts and views on these different perspectives, but this is that final week that we see in verse 27. And he, that is the prince that is to come, will make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. And this is something that we could look at in the context of last week. We'll see this also come up later on in other uh, sermons and passages where even Christ's own words were speaking about some of these events as future tense. Jesus also spoke about an abomination of desolations that is future. Not what actually happened through the Maccabean revolt and everything in the Old Testament period. It was a picture of things to come, but these are a future thing. And we saw that in the context last week of this horn that would rise and overthrow three of the other ten horns and so on. Just some of the pictures and the imagery through that, which speaks of a future rule and reign of an individual and, a, and, and other ten kings that come onto the world scene. But what we start seeing here is a timeline occurring that commences now with a covenant being signed. And this covenant will be for one week or one period of sevens, being seven years. And so most people will interpret this as a future seven-year tribulation that will come on the world. Seven years when events are going to play out, and we will look at that also in two weeks as to what this, this tribulation period looks like. What do the Scriptures have to speak more about that? But to trigger it, we're seeing a covenant of some sort would be signed. And we need to understand then a few little details behind that. Again, we won't analyze all of those today, but we see that somewhere in the middle of this one-week covenant, something happens. We're reading here that a covenant is broken, that there is an end to sacrifice, and that desolations, or there are abominations that are going to come until the decreed end is poured out on the desecrator or the desolator which seems to indicate that if this is all centred around Israel and around Jerusalem, it requires that there needs to be a temple or sacrifices occurring in order to be cut off. And it's impossible that these things have happened any, at any other time in the world history because if you remember, at AD 70, the temple was destroyed. And so the, the, there was no ability to sacrifice. So in the middle of what? When has Israel ever started up sacrifice again? Well, they haven't. And that leads most people to see that during a future seven-year tribulation period, there would be a temple that gets rebuilt, that Israel would resume sacrifice. And in the middle of that, a covenant is going to be broken for, and then for a remaining three and a half years until the end coming. So we will unpack that at another time. But most will see that as being a seven-year tribulation comprised of two lots of three and a half years. In the middle of that, there is a temple that's to be rebuilt. And if you look at the news or anything that's going on in the land of Israel, they're just needing the go-ahead and they're ready to rebuild the temple. They could rebuild that in record time. Estimates are they could build it in less than 18 months. So there could be a covenant or something established that would enable the temple to be rebuilt and for things to start. And we know when that occurs, we're looking at a seven-year window for a certain events to occur. And that's the assurance we get from the Scriptures of what God says coming true, especially when we look at this in light of the book of Revelation. And again, that three and a half years, time, time and half a time, 1,260 days, it appears again for us 
in the book of Revelation. And really, this is what we've seen here, is that the end comes. It's a future seven years, and we're seeing that desecrated. Jesus spoke of the abomination of desolation, and it's at the end of this that we would see that sevenfold purpose being fulfilled. So with that, the angel Gabriel has now given Daniel his correction, help clarify his thinking, that whilst their exile is coming to an end, that there is a much longer history that God has in mind. There are 490 years comprised of, of 483 years and then another final seven-year period with a gap in between. And it's through all that time that Israel will still actually be under judgment where Gentiles will control Jerusalem and so on. One kingdom is going to rise and then fall and another one take its place. We know that from the scriptures and from Daniel and other places that this is to occur. But it's just been given that picture. And so now, just putting it on a timeline, if the visuals help you here, is that we can see lined up with Daniel's 2 and 7 and here 9, we see that God's timeline for the nation of Israel for the church age in there and so on, is coming out to to its full fruition. And with the end of those 70 weeks is with the return of Christ as Messiah to set up His kingdom that we see these seven things being fulfilled, that at that time there would be an end to transgression, that we would have an end to sin, that iniquity will be fully atoned for, and that everlasting righteousness will have been brought in. We will see the need for vision and profit go away because Christ will be here. And we also see a a most holy place, a new temple having been anointed, and following then we see Christ's rule and reign stretching then out into eternity. And that's what we have to look forward to over the coming weeks as we unpack this a little more. So with that, I know that there's probably a lot of detail that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks together. But you can take away from this a great assurance, knowing that God is sovereign and that He has all things in His hand, that whilst many men will seem to scheme and come up against Him, that God is sovereign, He's decreed certain things that shall come to pass. And whilst kingdoms will rise and kingdoms fall, empires rise and empires fall and men scheme, God's laughing at them in that, as we read in Psalm 2 last week that God knows the end from the beginning. He's decreed all these things that shall come to pass. And when we look at this, we also don't need to fear these things either, that we're not scared of world events. We know that God is sovereign. He's playing these things out according to a plan. And with that comes the blessing that we see as we study prophecy together, that blessed hope where we look forward to the day that Christ will come back and receive us to Himself. Would you close with me in a word of prayer? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time in your Word, and whilst we look at the details of this, it is so easy to be caught up in those fine details and interpret them the way that we want. But we know, Lord, that you have written in your Word some precise words that are intended for a particular purpose. And Lord, as we study that, we pray that you would continue to help us to also understand these in the context of everything you're wanting to teach us from your Word. But we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign you have your hand on all these events of world history and that whilst we cannot understand even fully the things that are occurring around us, we know that you have a plan, that you have an end that we're working toward. And may knowing that give us great joy and assurance as we go through life, knowing that even our prayers are heard by you. When we pray, they reach your throne. You hear us, but also our lives are also in your hand. And we give you thanks and take assurance and comfort that and give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus we ask and pray. Amen.